So our, our final speaker today, Dr. Francisco Arriaga, Associate Professor of Soil Science at UW-Madison. Um, he'll talk about recent soil moisture and temperature data and the effects on planting um, in, the growing, in the upcoming growing season. Francisco, it's all yours. Thank you, Josh. So I'm gonna be giving you a little bit of an outlook uh, and things to think about for the planting season, uh, just sort of early on, um, just kind of a recap of things and good afternoon to everyone. So what are the things that we need to consider this spring or, or as far as on the management side? Uh, obviously tillage is a big one. Dan talked about cover crop termination, uh, planting, that's gonna be another, another big one. And perhaps maybe even manure application needs to be sort of thrown in the mix. Um, so the question I have, I guess, for you, and some of you have seen different versions of this, is should I consider different management because of drought conditions? And so this is sort of the, the overlapping question or overarching question here for this uh, um, talk that I share with you here. Uh, you've seen some of the uh, top information that Steve shared. This is from the drought uh, monitor based out of uh, University of Nebraska. Um, you can see sort of where we stand, uh, where there's a different intensities uh, depicted by the different colors for the uh, intensity of, of drought. In Wisconsin, we still have some issues. Um, I believe Steve showed this uh, type of information. So I've been kind of trying to keep an eye on this uh, since uh, last fall. So this is the map from September 5th, looking at Wisconsin and like, and, and at that time, you know, bulk of the state, over 90% of the state was in a drought, as you can see on that table on the right, that's the percentage of the state on the different drought uh, categories. Um, and the year before, if you look at the bottom uh, line or row on that uh, table, um, about 20% of the state was in drought, where 80% was not. Fast forward to November 7th, you know, change, things change uh, rather quickly, like Steve was saying. And at that time, about 70% or so of the state was under some kind of drought stage on November 7th. Uh, and prior year to that, uh, well, three months before that, uh, almost all the state, over 90 or about 98% of the state, and a year before that, we still have some kind of uh, drought stress across the state. Um, this is January, January uh, the 30th. So there was, again, things were more similar to November 7th, uh, as you see here between these two, two maps. And this is uh, the same map that, that um, uh, Steve showed, uh, looking at April 2nd, so about a week or so ago, the most recent data available. Uh, and currently we have about 80-some um, percent of the state on a, on a drought, about uh, 87 or so, um, which it's a little bit less than three months ago and um, a lot more than it was about a year ago, if you can look in the in the graph. So we still, like Steve was saying, we still have some drought stress across the state and it varies depending where you are um, and the different outlook. So one of the things I did too is similar to what Steve showed you is this drought severity and coverage index is at this DESCI. So I wanted to look at how did we compare now this year, this 2023 season, how do we compare to, for example, 2012, uh, where there's a 2012. And the idea with this index is it's just basically a summation uh, of products or multiplication of the different percentage of the drought at different periods, and then add it up to come up with the index in this case, a little bit different, uh, but, but a similar concept that what Steve showed. Uh, where 50 is sort of your threshold, anything above 50, uh, it's considered uh, a drought period or a dry period. And so in 2012, you can see there at the height of it was about 250. Um, but what I want to show you, I got to move my menu for Zoom in the way I cannot see the dates. <laughs> That's a little technical glitch here on my end. There we go. So able to grab it and move it. All right. So in there we see for 2012 that uh, the values above 50 or sort of what's considered a drought started in um, April or so, April 1st of 2012, and it continued on till um, August or so of 2013. So it extended um, a good portion of time. The other period that a lot of people 
a lot of you remember and people still talked about is that 20, uh, 2008, 2009. And as you can see there, that range of, of uh, dry period as uh, depicted by the uh, DSEI index here, um, value, it, it was much larger. It covered from uh, early 2008 and it went into uh, quite late uh, 2009, almost into, into 2010. So can we learn anything about this? about the, our current conditions. Yeah, no, really, I guess not really, but I guess the point here being is that the drought could very easily uh, alleviate itself or maybe we things change, but it looks like right now as far as precipitation, uh, we are gonna be about uh, average or so. Um, and you'll see a couple of figures that I have here, a couple of slides here in a second. Uh, but the issue is gonna be that our temperature uh, it's predicted to be higher, as Steve, as Steve mentioned. So I guess the take home from this is that we need to keep an eye as we're working with our systems. So, sorry, I'm trying to move this Zoom menu. I don't know why. I'm going to put it up here, maybe out of the way. All right. So here we have the precipitation outlook, and this is just for April. So I just kind of wanted to concentrate on uh, early planting season for this year. And you can see that a good part of the state, uh, it's it's uh, forecasted for, for the month, for the rest of the month to be below uh, normal. So if you look at the, um, at the legend on the bottom, uh, look at that color. So it's predicted to be about between 30 to 40% below normal. Uh, the chances that we'll have precipitation that is below normal. If you look at temperature, um, we have a, quite a quite a high chance that temperatures are going to be higher than normal. And so what we need to think about that is that higher temper temperatures can result in greater soil moisture losses because we very likely can have greater evaporation and greater transpiration from plants. So uh, evapotranspiration will likely be higher. That means that we'll, we plants can potentially be using a little bit more water out of the profile than usual because they're trying to keep cool and uh, do their photosynthesis as, as optimally as they can. So that is a concern. So that brings us to the growing season. So, um, like Steve was talking about, the moisture in the profile, it's partially depleted. And by that, what I mean is not where it typically is uh, uh, for this time of the year. Um, precipitation is expected to be below or at normal levels. So we're starting with a profile that it's drier. You could reason that we would need a little bit more precipitation, hopefully in a timely manner. That means not all at once, so it runs off, but in a way that it infiltrates into the soil and not run off to be able to recharge a profile and have enough water for crops. And keep in mind that a soybean or corn crop needs about 25 inches or so, 24 of, uh, of water uh, during the growing season. And a really nice soil, which is typically still loam te texture um, that holds the most plant available water can only hold about 10 to 11 inches, 10 to 12 inches of water. Um, so we do need that 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 water in a timely manner for our crops. Temperatures are expected to be above normal, increasing the potential for evapotranspiration, like I said, which leads to greater, potentially greater loss of soil moisture. So, um, so there is a possibility that we could have some moisture stress this season, maybe early on. I hope not, but that could be, it's just a possibility. So thinking about that, that there could be that possibility as we continue to monitor and you continue to monitor your fields or the fields of your clients and so on, what are the things that we should be considered? Should we change management practices? And the answer to that question, like I said, the overarching question that I had for this, yes, we should be considering different uh, as the season progresses and think about it. So some of the things uh, being talked about here, Dan talked about residue and residue management. Another one is compaction. Compaction can affect uh, uh, the water and the soil in various ways, cover crop termination. Um, if you have a cover crop, that cover crop is green. It's actually taking some water out of the soil. So that's another thing to consider. But you throw in there, as you saw with Dan's uh, presentation, tillage also has a, an impact and, and uh, they affect each other. 
uh, planting, um, mainly planting depths. So if we were a little bit drier, maybe we need to place our seeds a little bit deeper to get to that moisture. And then there's other other uh, practices that I'm really not going to talk about, but you know, one one big one would be herbicides because a lot of herbicides need moisture to get activated and do their thing. Uh, but certainly, these are things that are going to be affecting or be affected by the moisture in the profile. So one of the things that we talked about is reduced tillage and no tillage. That yes, it can increase the amount of moisture in the soil because of the better soil health, if you will, the better structure, more organic matter, increases the water holding capacity, but also the residue on the surface protects the soil like mulch. Uh, so as it does, for example, in your garden at home, your flower bed or what have not, you, we put mulch to control weeds, but it also holds a lot of moisture. However, those benefits come from long-term practices. So for this, this season, if you have uh, not been on a no-till system, you're not long-term going now to no-till might not be the best best option or solution so but however reducing the number of passes perhaps would be an option every time you do a tillage pass and it varies again on the water content of the soil it varies on the conditions the wind and all those other things time of the year and the type of tillage and the depth but on the average when you do a pass of tillage you could lose about a quarter of an inch of moisture out of that soil depending on the soil that you're working with and the conditions you're working with it could also affect um, it, that, that drying of the surface soil could actually help maintain the moisture deeper in the profile. But in a lot of cases, it actually exacerbates the losses and you tend to lose even more. So there's a lot of other, other factors at play there too. Uh, but in general, uh, tillage pass, will you will be losing some moisture. So if you do one tillage pass, you're going to lose X amount. If you're going to do a second tillage pass, you're going to lose even more. So reducing the number of passes will help. Um, if you have compaction, obviously you'll need tillage. Hopefully that was taken care of in the, in the fall. Um, but compaction is kind of a funny one. If you have compacted soils, because the structure of, of that soil is typically compromised, you have more small pore space connectivity. The little pores in the soil are more connected. Um, that tends to wick up water out of deeper in the profile. You can end up actually, if it's a severe drought, that compacted soil can end up even drier than a not compacted condition. So that's sort of a double whammy because you have lower root exploration because of the compaction, lower infiltration. So therefore you have less recharge of the profile. So this is because of soil structure damage. So um, I recognize that this is not something you can address this, this year, but thinking forward, thinking about soil structure, soil health could be beneficial. I'm gonna skip this, but basically this graph is showing in the interest of time, but this graph is showing that a compacted soil having a lower pore space has le a lower capacity to hold water. So I'm not going to go in depth to it. So just looking at the right column where it says water to 18 inches of depth, you can go from a non-compacted condition of 1.4, that's grams per centimeter cube soil, that holds almost three inches of water. If you compact that soil, and that's the last row then, you're losing about three quarters of an inch of, of water holding capacity down to just a 18 inch of depth. So compaction, it's, it's not a good thing. I'm uh, just going to skip that for the interest of time. Residue, it's, it's key. Residue management should have started back in the fall after after harvest or during harvest, actually. And so uh, the message, too, with the tillage and the residue is that if you leave that residue on the surface, will help, uh, again, provide a mulching effect, provide a shading effect, and keep the wind from hitting the soil directly and drying that soil so uh, surface residue helps keep the moisture on the surface of the soil. Um, about cover crops, mention it uh, here briefly and then talked at length about them. Really good information he presented. Um, if the cover crops are green, um, they will be using moisture and they'll, as they develop and grow, they're going to evapotranspire. So that's something to, to, to think about. But also think about which that against the amount of residue you have on the surface of the soil, because that residue from the cover crop will help you too. But if you're a little worried, maybe consider uh, terminating that cover crop a little bit earlier in the spring in the spring this year. Uh, but again, if you don't have a lot of residue and the only residue you have the cover crop, maybe you're better off with leaving that cover crop residue uh, there on the surface. Um, I know you cannot go back and plant something different, but consider maybe if you're concerned about this in the future too, maybe a, a cover crop that winter kills. However, with that, you're going to get less benefit of, as far as weed control and uh, 
that surface residue and soil health benefits. So um, we've been talking a lot about soil moisture here and, 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 and so on and so forth. So are there ways that you can keep an eye on soil moisture and look at it? So um, there's some information presented here, again, by Steve looking at some of that. Uh, here is some uh, satellite base information uh, from, a, from a satellite uh, group. Uh, they, they call themselves Crop Casma and it's freely available. Uh, this is the moisture conditions for Wisconsin uh, from uh, March 25th to the 31st. On the left is the topsoil, on the right is the subsoil, and you can see the scale way, way to your right on your screen, where is the volumetric soil moisture content. Uh, if you multiply that by 100, that gives you a percentage. Um, so anywhere going from zero all the way down to 65%, if you will, on the dark blue. Typically in the soil, we're not going to have that had that uh, wet of a soil now unless it's completely flooded. But if you look at the topsoil, we have some areas there that the moisture is about 10% or so. Some of that corresponds around the uh, central sands area and around the Wisconsin River Valley, which are sandier soils. But up north, also we see some some dry spots on the topsoil. Uh, but the rest of the state where you see that that little bit darker green or the, or the kind of like the lime green, um, that's actually not too bad. But if you look at the subsoil, we see that there's good chunks of the state that the subsoil is quite dry. Um, how dry? So this is the anomaly or comparison to normal. And again, this is from that crop gas map. It has different data layers that you can create in, in, uh, and add to, to your maps. And, and, and you can look at different parts of the US and all that kind of stuff, it's pretty cool. Uh, but you can see on the topsoil and the subsoil, we are below uh, where, where we should be. Uh, there's a couple of spots that, that uh, were wetter, but if you see most of the state is in that uh, beige tone or brown colors, which means we're below. Um, so we are still not fully recovered and hopefully things will go in um, our way, hopefully, and things will get better. So that's one product you can use to kind of look and roughly get an idea of where the soil moisture is and, and sort of it's, it, keep track of it. Um, you still will have to go down to your field to, to look at it, I think, uh, field by field, and I'll give you a, um, a way of doing that quick. But I wanted to show too that uh, here in the state, we're very lucky that we have this runoff risk advisory forecast. Uh, we typically use for runoff risk advisory. So this is the runoff risk map for today. As you can see on the right, there's a slider that you can change the dates up to, I think, 10 days. Um, but if you look on top, there is these tabs you can see on that red box. So there's other information, and one of them is soil saturation. There's soil temperatures, there's precipitation. Obviously, the scale of this, it's a little bit coarse, but it's not super fine. But this is the soil saturation now for the states as of, as of today, which according to this product is very dry. This data actually come from, uh, from NOAA. Uh, they're provided uh, to... Um, a person that maintains this and, and, and then added this to the automatically gets added to the model, but it's it's actually provided by NOAA and, and not exactly sure they don't they're not very open about how they calculate it, but they have this information they've been using for other tools and other products. But this is another way you can kind of keep an eye on conditions too. Uh, but it perhaps is a little bit more coarse than the one I showed you a second ago, that crop casma. So you go down to your field, you can actually use a, a field testing method. Um, here you can basically see what it should look like for different soil textures and the soil, when you pick it up, it should for, uh, feel moist and you can pick it up from whatever depth you're of interest. And, and, you know, this spring, obviously around two inches, three inches to see what's out there for planting. You should be able to form a weak ball. If you kind of squish it on your hand and the palm of your hand, it should be a little bit dark in color. The moisture usually in the soil darkens the color, enhances that color on the soil. Um, there should be very little to no staining on your hand and, and your aggregates should kind of maintain, right? It should not be a powder. It should not be either um, like a modeling clay or like a Play-Doh type, type feeling either. Um, if you really want to go fancy, there's handheld devices uh, that you can buy. They're, they're not inexpensive, um, typically ranging from six, $800 to uh, thousands. Uh, but Maybe there's somebody, crop console, somebody, or, or, or maybe you're so interested you want to get all these tools, but there's other ways of doing it. But this, this way of doing the field method is it's actually quite good. So just in closing, in the interest of time, because I believe, yep, we're running out of time here. 
So obviously it's a moisture, it's gonna be a major consideration this spring. Crop residue on the surface, that's one of the other keys. Try to reduce the amount of tillage passes, that's another key. Uh, kind of keep an eye on your cover crops and the management, but remember that interconnection or relationship with, with the tillage that you have been using, your historical tillage, if you will. And um, think about in the future, you know, different tillage practices, reduced tillage can help, no-till can help. Compaction is an issue too with drought uh, because you have a lower infiltration capacity, but also you can have higher losses. And one thing that I uh, might be the the one of the key things this year too will be to keep uh, looking at uh, seed placement and see how how deep is that moisture, the adequate moisture for those seeding. We might have to adjust that a little bit. Uh, with that, uh, that's all I had for you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Francisco, for joining our program.